Good morning, and welcome to Westside Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm the Reverend Carol Badeau. I'm pleased to serve Westside as minister and happy to have you here with us today. Today's service is a special one. We are uh, welcoming Gary Jackaway, uh, who is a wonderful UU speaker, and um, he's going to be speaking today about being in exile and what it means to be in exile and how that might be an opportunity. He's going to be sharing some history with us and also sharing some reflections on Passover. So today uh, I invite you to just center yourself in a sense of openness to the possibility of thinking about history, your own history, our collective history in a different way, and thinking about putting ourselves in the shoes of someone else, maybe who might be experiencing exile or challenges differently than we might be. Our chalice lighting words this morning are written by, were written by um, an unknown Jewish prisoner in a concentration camp. These words were found on a cellar wall in a, in a concentration camp in Cologne, Germany. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. And I believe in love, even when there's no one there. And I believe in God, even when he is silent. I believe through any trial, there is always a way. But sometimes in this suffering and hopeless despair, my heart cries for shelter to know someone's there. But a voice within me saying, hold on, my child, I'll give you strength, rises. I'll give you hope. Just stay a little while. May there someday be sunshine. May there someday be happiness. May there someday be love. May there someday be peace. I invite you to take a deep breath. Center into your body and into this moment and Allow yourself to receive the words that Gary is going to share with you today. There are dozens of songs that have been based on Psalm 137, including the version my dear friend Karen Parker sang a few minutes ago. It is the only song that is in both the teal and the gray Unitarian Universalist hymnal. And it's also worth noting that the Babylonian exile is the only Old Testament story told in the play Godspell. Now, the first verse of the song as taken from Psalm 137 has these lyrics. By the water of Babylon, where we sat down and where we wept when we remember Zion. The Jews found themselves captive, strangers in a strange land in the city of Babylon, the crown jewel of its time. Their temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. They are not allowed to build a new one. Their priests and rulers are either dead or no longer in control. The Jewish people are on their own, captives in Babylon. The next verse is, and the people carried us away, captivity required of us a song. How can we sing our holy song in a strange land? In this sense, today's service is a counterpoint to last week's. Last Sunday, Reverend Carol, shared with us a hymn that has this line, quote, since love prevails in heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? And today we ask the opposite. How can we sing our holy song in a strange land? Or to put it another way, how does one react to exile, to misfortune, with anger, with depression? But there is an aspect of exile that's perhaps not so obvious. In the long run, exile creates an opportunity to reinvent oneself. When one is running the place, there often isn't time and energy for change. And one has a commitment to the status quo, so one is unlikely to risk change. But when one is exiled, there is little to lose. One has the chance to re-examine all that has gone before and especially all that has gone wrong. Now, it turns out that many of the things that we think of as Judaism were developed during the Babylonian exile. There's no temple, and the Jews are only allowed to meet in small gatherings. Those gatherings grew into what are now called synagogues. 
and to maintain cohesion among the Jews, they begin to keep the Sabbath. As David Stowe puts it in his book, Song of Exile, which is entirely about Psalm 137, quote, the trauma served as a crucible, forcing the Israelites to rethink their relationship to Yahweh, revise their understanding of the covenant, reassess their standing as a chosen people, rewrite their history. And as Bruce Feiler says more poetically, with the loss of holy space, holy time becomes important. And a key change was elevating the words of the Bible to the central part of Jewish life. So Jews had to be educated in the words. It was no longer up to the high priests who were no more. Individuals had to learn to read the Bible themselves. Schools, yeshivas, were formed. And from these yeshivas grew one of the most amazing documents of humankind, the Talmud. Now, the Talmud, bega the Talmud began as a, an oral history of discussions concerning the meaning of the Bible. One interesting fact about the Talmud, both sides of an argument are typically presented, sometimes without a definitive answer. The Babylonian Talmud evolved into the written explanation of all of Judaism, documenting everything from how and when one should sacrifice to God to which shoe to put on first. It was truly the Wikipedia of the Jewish people, written by hundreds of people, all men, sadly, over thousands of years. As the Jews followed empires through North Africa and into Europe, the Talmud came with them. Well, now to bring the obvious parallels to light. It is the fall of 2016. Those of us who self-describe as liberals had achieved goals many of us thought unimaginable a scant 20 years earlier. We elected a black president. Gay marriage was the law of the land. And we appeared to be moments away from electing the first woman president. And then exile. Of course, we weren't pulled from our homes and forced to march through the desert but for myself, I learned of a sudden that this was not the country I thought I lived in. I was truly a stranger in a strange land. Now, just as the Jews reinvented Judaism, I thought the left needed to reinvent liberalism to understand how it had lost touch with so many Americans. Yes, it was important to rail against the policies of the Trump administration, but the essential job that needed to be done was to consider what worked and what really did not, and to think about how to explain the liberal message to others. We had been given a rare opportunity, an opportunity created by political exile. And frankly, I think we squandered it. Understand, the landscape did not change all of a sudden in November 2016, nor did it change back all of a sudden in November 2020 as events quickly revealed. I don't want to get too caught up in the politics of the matter, but let me just point to one ray of hope, Braver Angels. Here is an organization devoted to bringing red and blue together through a process of deep listening. I only learned of the group a few months ago and have yet to attend one of their many seminars, but from take, talking to those involved, I can see that they have taken up the standard of creating understanding, of changing the conversation, of bridging the divide. And our time of pandemic can also be seen as a time of exile from our standard way of being. Perforce, much of our lives has been reimagined. Work has been redefined with much of it done online. And socially, socializing has been changed or eliminated. Religious practice like this service has had to evolve. Weddings and far too many funerals have had to be reinvented. And it will be intriguing to watch as the pandemic fades, how many of these changes remain and how much of our lives return to what it was like before the pandemic. I suspect that many of these changes will be permanent and others will impact our life in smaller ways.
much as the Babylonian exile changed Judaism forever. Now, Psalm 137 echoed through the ages and when it, from when it was first transcribed. It was referenced by Petrarch and St. Augustine and Martin Luther. It came to the Americas with the Massachusetts Bay Colony's songbook. But most importantly, it gave solace to oppressed and exiled groups throughout the world. The Irish exiled to the US due to the potato famine, even Koreans subjugated by Imperial Japan looked to Psalm 137. And of course, African-Americans enslaved in the new world. Over the past 200 years, this Psalm has been used by a number of African-American luminaries. It was quoted by Frederick Douglass in his famous Rochester speech explaining why African-Americans should not celebrate July 4th. And it was sung by Paul Robeson, who suggested that Blacks and Jews had much in common from their shared experience of exile, and who himself was ostracized during the McCarthy period. And it was the African-American take on one particular line that drew my attention. How can we sing our holy song in a strange land? Now, I had assumed that was rhetorical, that the Jews refused to entertain their captives. But there's much more to it than that. For many African-American speakers, the point is, how could you not sing? Why give your captors power by no longer singing your holy songs? For by singing your holy songs, you are demonstrating that you are unbowed, unbroken. Your oppressors may have taken your land, destroyed your temple, and exiled you from your home. But you still have your life, your faith, your belief, your dignity. So sing. Now, this seems to me a more advanced approach than wallowing in grief. <laughs> Reverend C. L. Frank Franklin, a mid-20th mid century Detroit African-American minister, whom MLK called his favorite preacher, and who, by the way, was Aretha Franklin's father, put it this way, quote, I take the position that they should have sung. Yes, they were in a strange land. Yes, they were among so-called heathens. Yes, the situation in which they found themselves was an unfamiliar situation and not conducive to inspire them into spiritual expression. But even under adverse circumstances, you ought to sing sometimes. And not only sing, sing some Zion's songs. More recently, Reverend Jeremiah Wright of Chicago expanded on the theme, talking about Daniel, who was exiled in Babylon. In Babylon. Quote, they had taken away his history and his name. They had taken away his heritage. But when they tried the ultimate takeaway, when they tried to take away his religion, they did what all oppressors do. They tried to take away his hope. But Daniel had the audacity of hope, unquote. Of course, Reverend Rice's most famous parishioner, President Obama, chose to name his second book, The Audacity of Hope. As another African-American preacher put it, don't let your location and your situation obscure your destination. And that can be the central result of exile, evolution to a better state of mind and being. This is an internal evolution every bit as much as an external one. Speaking of evolving, I must point out that evolution also occurred within the song based on this hymn. Because few of the versions ever bother to mention the final stanza of the original song. In that stanza, the rage of Jews against their captors is expressed in full-throated form. Quote, 
daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Well, this encouragement toward vengeance is so harsh that only the Orthodox Jewish liturgy includes it. Reformed and conservative congregations skip that section of the psalm. And similarly, in the hymn in the great UU hymnal, this stanza is left off. But in the Teal hymnal, you find a, a different final stanza than the one that I'm most familiar with and also the one that Karen sang. Now, according to David Stowe, it was the Melodians, a Rastafarian musical group in Jamaica in the 1960s that added this third verse, which is actually from a completely different psalm, number 19. I should tell you that for a brief time, this song, the Melodians version, was banned in Jamaica because of its anti-government themes. But eventually the Jamaican government realized that Banning a song whose words were taken almost whole cloth from the Old Testament wasn't a good idea. So the words used from Psalm number 19 are these. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O for I. O for I means blessed one or blessings, okay? Now, I find this particularly enlightening because over the millennia, we have transcended anger and replaced it with a search for inner peace in the midst of exile. This is truly evolution of becoming better as humans. And I have come to realize that for me, the question of how I sing my holy song in a strange land is answered in that final verse taken from a different psalm. The psalm says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. This is the real transformation that occurred in Babylon. The big change was in the relationship between each Jew and God. God was no longer locked in the temple on the mount. He was everywhere. And each Jew was to develop a personal relationship with God through the study of the words in the Torah, and through maintaining Jewish custom. The Babylonian exile may be the first moment in, in history where individuals were instructed to create a personal relationship with a monotheistic God. That relationship is fundamental to Christianity and also to Unitarian Universalism. It is the individual's relationship with the divine that is front and center. Note in particular the change from plural to singular. The first part of the song has where we wept, where we remember Zion, and carried us away, required of us a song. But this new verse says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. In a sense, the Babylonian exile completes the story of Exodus. God does not simply give the promised land to the Jews. He enters into a covenant, as I believe the divine does with each of us. That the words of my mouth, that is the actions that I take, and the meditation of my heart, my thoughts and feelings, be acceptable to the divine. Maintaining the implicit covenant of the life I have been given to become the best person I can. Now it turns out the Babylonian exile only lasted about 60 years, but it was arguably one of the most critical periods in the 5,000 year history of the Jews. Once again, God spoke to a non-Jew and asked him to intervene. In this case, the Persian empire, Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great, and by the way, he was really pretty great, conquered the Babylonians and freed the Jews. Cyrus is probably worth a service on his own. He allowed the subjects of his vast empire to practice the religion of their choice, perhaps the first emperor to allow that level of religious freedom. 
Now, while some Jews returned to Jerusalem, taking the transformed Judaism with them, most stayed in Babylon. Babylon was a major trade center, and for them, it was the only home that they had known. With their new portable relationship with God, they need not be at the temple in Jerusalem to be one with God. But the yearning for Jerusalem continues to this day. The last line of every Passover Seder is next year in Jerusalem. And God changed his tack as well, focusing not so much on kings, but instead on prophets from leading with force to leading with moral authority. The exile from power for the political left lasted only four years, but the lessons of Babylon are best taken to heart. One cannot depend on leading with the force of political power. Instead, let us do our best to lead from moral authority. Let us find new ways to help those in need, to defend the downtrodden, and to be unafraid to speak truth to power. Amen and blessed be. Thank you so much, Gary and Karen. Yeah, I'm with Karen. We can all do the big heart for that one. Thank you so much for that, um, for helping us reflect on the various kinds of exile many of us may be feeling or have felt over the last many months and even years. As we close this time together of reflection, I invite you to take a deep breath and call into yourself your own awareness of your own feeling of exile, wherever that comes from. Whether that is feeling exiled from family or from this building, from a sense of familiarity or power, whatever it is, that feeling of having been cast aside from that which was known. And let us all take a moment to just allow the light of the chalice and the wisdom of Gary's words to seep into our hearts, reminding us of that hope and the possibility of being renewed, of renewal that might come in the future. So as I extinguish the chalice, I remind us that that light of seeking truth and wisdom always is with us. And the passion that we share for values and for a better world, and also just the warmth of being together in this new way coming back together even in a time of exile. We carry these in our hearts until we are together again. And I invite you all to remain for conversation about this service and also for our congregational meeting together. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.